Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be talking about fiscal policy and automatic stabilizers. If after watching this video, you still need a little more help, head over to ReviewEcon.com and pick up the total review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. Let's get into the content. So first of all, we need to know what fiscal policy is. Fiscal policy is government tools that can be used to fight unemployment or inflation. Those are two of our macroeconomic goals, full employment and stable prices. And the president and Congress can help us reach those two macroeconomic goals through changes in taxes and government spending. And so if in the ASAD model, we are not at long run equilibrium, perhaps we have a recessionary gap like we do there on the left, or a inflationary gap like we do there on the right, then it is possible for properly designed fiscal policy to get us back to long run equilibrium. That's where inflation is low and the natural rate of unemployment will equal the current rate of unemployment. But you might remember that the economy will fix itself because in the long run, wages and other resource prices are flexible. And that's why we have a vertical long run aggregate supply curve, because in the long run, we will get back to full employment output. But according to John Maynard Keynes, the founder of modern economics, in the long run, we're all dead. And that's where fiscal policy can speed up the process, returning us to long run equilibrium more quickly. Now, taxes are our first fiscal policy tool we're going to talk about. When we increase taxes, that is going to decrease disposable income. And when there's less disposable income, that's going to decrease consumer spending. So increases in taxes are going to decrease the amount of consumer spending within the economy and decreases in taxes will increase the amount of consumer spending within the economy. The next tool is government spending. When consumers are not spending, the government can spend directly. Government spending includes government purchases, as we see in the output expenditure model. Those could be tanks for our military. They could be the services of a teacher, or it could be the construction of a highway. We call those government purchases infrastructure, and those can actually boost the long run growth of the overall economy. And another type of government spending we have is transfer payments. Transfer payments are things like food stamps or unemployment compensation. That is where the government is giving money to people who are likely to spend it. Increasing transfer payments is going to increase consumer spending and decreasing transfer payments will decrease consumer spending. So now that we know the fiscal policy tools of taxes and government spending, let's talk about how we can use them if we are needing to have expansionary fiscal policy. Expansionary fiscal policy is when the government is trying to fight unemployment. That means we have a recessionary gap in the ASAD model and our current level of output is less than our full employment level of output. To fight unemployment, the federal government could increase government spending and or decrease taxes. Either one of those actions or potentially both of those actions combined can be used to close a recessionary gap. Here we have in the ASAD model, the Y1, that's our current level of output or our current short run equilibrium is less than YF, which is the full employment level of output that we will have in the long run. And because we have a lower than full employment level of output, we have high levels of unemployment within this economy and increasing government spending or decreasing government taxes is actually going to increase G or increase C. That's government purchases or consumption. Either one of those or combinations of both will shift that aggregate demand curve to the right, restoring long run equilibrium. Now we have a higher price level and a higher level of output. If instead of a recessionary gap, we had an inflationary gap like we have here and the government decreases taxes or increases spending, that would be pro-cyclical. That means that the government's action is actually making the inflationary gap bigger. It would still shift that aggregate demand curve to the right, further increasing our output to Y2. And now the price level is PL2, but our gap between our current level of output and our long run potential is wider than it was. Now, if the economy is actually in an inflationary gap, then contractionary fiscal policy can be used to fight inflation. That means that the government is going to decrease spending and or increase taxes. Increasing taxes will reduce the amount of disposable income that consumers have, and that will reduce consumer spending. So over on the graph here, we have our inflationary gap. The decrease in government spending and or increase in taxes will decrease G or decrease C, and that will shift our aggregate demand curve to the left restoring our full employment level of output at a lower price level. 
And that lower price level means that inflation is going to be reduced. But you'll notice that contractionary fiscal policy actually reduces output. And that means we're going to see higher levels of unemployment. And that's why contractionary fiscal policy is not popular among politicians because it often means they won't be reelected. And that's why when it comes to fighting inflation, it's actually the Federal Reserve that usually puts the brakes on the economy. And you'll learn more about that in your next unit. If we currently have a recessionary gap and the government uses contractionary fiscal policy, that action is going to be pro-cyclical. It's going to still shift that aggregate demand curve to the left and make our recessionary gap bigger. And now we would actually see very high levels of unemployment as a result. So on your exam, just remember that it is possible for the government to take action that is going to make the recessionary or inflationary gap bigger. On your exam, that fiscal policy action is not necessarily going to be returning us to the long run equilibrium. Now, earlier in this unit, you may have learned about the spending multiplier and the tax multiplier. Here, we're going to talk about the balanced budget multiplier that can be used by the federal government to shift the economy around without impacting the budget. The spending multiplier has an absolute value that is one greater than the tax multiplier. That means that if the spending multiplier is four, the tax multiplier is negative three. And since that spending multiplier is just one greater than the tax multiplier, absolute value, that means if we have equal increases in taxes and spending, we are actually going to see an increase of real GDP by as much as one times the amount of the tax and spending increase. And so if we increase taxes by a billion dollars and increase spending by a billion dollars, the net effect is going to be an increase of GDP by at most $1 billion. And so increasing taxes and spending by the same amount, it's actually going to increase the aggregate demand curve, shifting it to the right. And if you decrease taxes by a billion dollars and decrease spending by a billion dollars, because the spending multiplier has an absolute value one greater than the tax multiplier, then aggregate demand is going to shift to the left. And real GDP will decrease by at most $1 billion in this example. So it's possible for the government to use fiscal policy to shift the aggregate demand curve without changing the budget deficit or the national debt. Next, we're going to talk about automatic stabilizers. Automatic stabilizers help to limit the fluctuations in the business cycle. And that means it helps make recessions more mild and inflationary gaps more mild as well. And that's because without any actions by the president or Congress, our budget deficit is automatically going to decrease during times of expansion and it's automatically going to increase during times of contraction. And these automatic stabilizers go into effect without any new actions by the president or Congress. One of those automatic stabilizers we have is taxes. Because our taxes are based on people's income, they automatically increase during expansionary periods because people are earning more income and as a result, they pay more taxes on that income. On the flip side, taxes automatically decrease during recessions or contractions and that's because people are going to be earning less income and as a result, they pay less income taxes. Transfer payments are another type of automatic stabilizer. Remember, transfer payments are things like unemployment compensation and welfare payments, as well as food stamp programs. And those are automatically going to decrease during times of expansion, because when our economy is booming, we're going to see fewer unemployed workers and we're going to see fewer families qualifying for food stamps and welfare programs. And when the economy is having a contraction, we're going to automatically see an increase in transfer payments because more people are going to qualify for unemployment compensation and more families will qualify for food stamps and other welfare programs. And so these automatic stabilizers help boost the economy when we have a contraction and slow down the economy when we have an expansion. Of course, fiscal policy isn't perfect, and there are plenty of people who believe that the government should not get involved in fixing the economy. Of course, the biggest concern of expansionary fiscal policy is the national debt. We now have, as of the making of this video, over $31 trillion of U.S. government debt, and it's only growing because during times of expansion, the deficit rises, increasing our national debt quicker. And that increase in the national debt causes a problem called crowding out. You're going to learn more about crowding out in unit five. But for now, you should know that it increases the nominal interest rate that businesses pay on their loans. And as a result, we see less gross investment. So expansionary fiscal policy can cause decreases in economic growth. And the last problem with fiscal policy is that there may be operational lag times. It takes time for us to recognize that there's a problem. It takes time for a solution to be developed. It takes time for Congress and the president to enact the legislation or the action they're trying to take. 
and it takes time for the action to take effect. And after all of that lag time, there's a chance that the government action could be pro-cyclical. The previous problem could be over by now, and maybe they're making the next problem worse. And that's why some people argue against government intervention through fiscal policy. And there you have it. That is everything you need to know about fiscal policy and automatic stabilizers. If after watching this video, you still need a little more help, head over to reviewecon.com and pick up that total review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. That's it for now. I'll see you all next time.